Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this year's IPS Northern Lecture Series by Professor Chan Hing Chi, our seventh SR Northern Fellow for the Study of Singapore. Today, Prof Chan will be giving her second lecture, which is the US-China rivalry, inevitable war or avoidable war. Following her lecture, Prof Chan will take questions from our Facebook comments. The Q&A session will be chaired by Professor Joseph Liao, Dean, College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, Nanyang Technological University. Here are some housekeeping rules at the start of our event. The lecture is being streamed live on Facebook. It will also be recorded and uploaded on the IPS website and Facebook page later. Please submit your comments and questions at any time through our Facebook page. We will try our best to answer as many as we can. We also would like to hear your view on the event. There will be a link on our Facebook page, which you can click to submit your feedback. May I now invite Professor Chan to give her lecture. Thank you. Director of IPS, Janadas Devon, Professor Joseph Liao. The US-China relationship is in a bad place today. For the United States, the China relationship has never been easy to define. Americans have always been ambivalent about how it should regard China. Is China a partner, a competitor, or an adversary? During the Cold War, China, a communist regime, was an adversary lumped together with the Soviet Union. But for much of the time, the focus was on the Soviet Union as the lead adversary. It was the other superpower in the bipolar world. China was then still considered backward and not a major industrial power. The communist world and the free world were two separate bounded orders. President Nixon's visit to China in 1972 was the game changer. According to Henry Kissinger, around 1969, China and the United States found strategic congruence in their international outlooks. The Sino-Soviet dispute had deepened with China regarding the Soviet threat as an imminent one. Even before he was elected in the 1968 presidential election, Nixon had been feeling his way towards China. Nixon was concerned to end the Vietnam War and about the post-Vietnam security scenario. He probably understood he could not end the Vietnam War without talking to China. In a foreign affairs article in 1967, Nixon wrote, and I quote, we simply cannot afford to leave China forever outside the family of nations, there to nurture its fantasies, cherish its hates, and threaten its neighbors. There is no place on this small planet for a billion of its potentially most able people to live in angry isolation, unquote. In fact, he called for dialogue and made an appeal for reconciliation. Richard McGregor, an Australian China hand, clearly identifies Nixon as the intellectual godfather of the opening to China, and he relied on Kissinger to bring it about. The two men then worked closely to plan and shape policy. The Shanghai communique normalized the bilateral relationship between the United States and China, with both sides agreeing to conduct their relationship on the basis of non-aggression, non-interference, equality, and mutual respect. On Taiwan, the United States acknowledged that for both sides of the strait, there is but one China, and Taiwan is a part of China, and reiterated its interest in a peaceful settlement. When Deng Xiaoping set China on the four modernizations path in 1978, in effect, overturning the central principles of the command economy to experiment with the market economy, he multiplied the possibilities of cooperation with the United States and the West. This was seen as China opening up to the world. The path of engagement was volatile. Nonetheless, it was remarkable that for almost 40 years, 1978 to 2017, the United States and China was in a relationship which could be described as strategic engagement. 
the US-China relationship flourished so long as both sides could focus on checking the hegemony of the Soviet Union. In fact, it was not so simple. The United States had to manage the complex triangular relationship of Washington, Moscow, and Beijing, although it was more tilted towards China throughout the late 70s and 80s, as the Soviet Union was seen as the bigger threat because of its expansionist policies in Asia. The Tiananmen episode in 1989, where Chinese tanks were brought out to fire on student protesters, shocked the world and caused the US to view China again as an ideological adversary. This was followed a few months later by the fall of the Berlin Wall and revolutions in Eastern Europe, which toppled the communist regimes, leading in the end to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Both developments ended the bipartisan con consensus in America on the need to work with China. Nonetheless, American presidents in subsequent years, George Herbert Walker Bush, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush continued to engage China, expanding their power to casual and persuade Congress to grant most favored nation, MFN, to China, support its joining WTO, limit arms sales to Taiwan, and expand trade relations with China. Barack Obama placed importance on cooperation with China to work on climate change, pandemics, and other transnational issues. Now, Jeff Bader, the point person in the Obama White House for Asia and someone I worked a lot with, said the period of working with China yielded many benefits for the United States. Firstly, US-China cooperation led to the containment of Soviet exp expansion during the Cold War and ultimately led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Secondly, the ending of hostility between the United States and China led to a long period of peaceful cooperation and bilateral non-aggression. Thirdly, with nudging from the United States and some pressure, China joined the other nuclear powers to oppose the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Now, this period also benefited China. Firstly, working together ASEAN, China, and the United States put sufficient pressure on Vietnam to force its withdrawal from Cambodia to agree to a comprehensive UN settlement and UN supervised elections. For China, this outcome ended the Soviet role in Cambodia, demonstrated that the Soviet Union could not protect its ally Vietnam whilst it could protect Cambodia, and Vietnam could not overturn a regime in Cambodia friendly to China. Secondly, after the normalization of relations with the United States and joining WTO, China grew unstoppably, adding to global growth and US prosperity at the same time. That working relationship has come apart. And I would like to use the rest of the lecture to answer three questions. Why did it come apart? How far will the relationship slide? And will we see an inevitable war or an avoidable war? Why did it come apart? Many point to the election of Donald Trump as president of the United States and Xi Jinping as president of the People's Republic of China as the inflection point of the US-China relationship. Now that would be a simplistic answer. While the two personalities ascending on the global stage at the same time may have affected the tone of the relationship, the real cause for the sharp deterioration was because the United States and China had moved towards an inherent instability of a structural nature. It has arisen, explains Kevin Rudd, because China is now of sufficient economic, military, and technological mass that it represents a structural challenge to long-term American dominance of the global and regional order. Unquote. The China challenge for America is now no longer a theoretical question. 
In addition, this is made worse by the fact that these two countries represent radically different political, cultural, and ideological systems. Graham Allison's Thucydides trap documents that in 12 of 16 cases where the rising power challenged the established power, war ensued. It seems that the chances of conflict are most acute when the challenging power comes close in aggregate power to the established power. Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and Hu Jintao each had used their leadership to move China along the track of strong economic growth and acquisition of military power to regain its position as a power to be respected in the region and the world, guided by the dictum Tao Guang Yang Hui. President Xi Jinping followed the same course, but he was different. When he took office, he launched two visions, clearly and boldly. The first vision was China Dream in 2013 to inspire the Chinese people to strive to achieve the Chinese dream of great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. The other was the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI as we know it, a breathtaking and ambitious project followed by the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Many major powers saw this not as just another economic and development project, but as a strategic challenge. What put the United States and other countries on notice was President Xi's 19th Party Congress speech, the abolition of term limits for the president and vice president at the Lianghui. Xi spoke of China moving center stage in this era. He held out that by 2035, China would be a modern socialist country, a global leader in terms of composite strength and ready to make a contribution to the world by 2050. Now, in themselves, these statements are legitimate aspirations of any major power. But the speech following activities in the South China Sea, BRI and AIIB was read by the United States and the West as China offering an alternative model and seeking predominance in the global system. I didn't read it as such. In fact, it is not just the American defense establishment, security analysts in think tanks and Congress that see the strategic competition. Chinese security intellectuals and policy elites also see, this, see it in this way. Now, unlike their American counterparts, Chinese analysts take the strategic competition between the US and China as a starting point. Many see it as a structural issue, an outcome of the redistribution of power in the international system. While some write about cooperation and competition in the relationship and competitive interdependence, a retired colonel, senior colonel, Liu Mingfu, asserts in his book, Zhong Guo Meng, The China Dream, that US-China conflicts are inevitable no matter how committed China is to a peaceful rise. US-China relations is a marathon wherein a face-off of the century would be seen. And Professor Yan Xue Tong, a respected Chinese strategic thinker from Tsinghua University, well known in international forums, bluntly recognizes that the United that the US-China strategic competition is inevitable between the hegemon and the rising power. Yen says, China has, a, has been narrowing the gap of its comprehensive national strength with that of the United States, the root cause of the growing competition. Yen believes the instability of the US-China relationship is due to both sides pursuing a policy of, and I quote him, pretending to be friends, unquote. The Trump administration dropped that pretense. In October 2017, Vice President Mike Pence delivered a hard-hitting speech at the Hudson Institute on Chinese economic aggression and interference in US politics. Many analysts saw this as the Trump administration declaring a new policy, 
and likened the speech to Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech. This was soon followed by the release of the NSS 2017 report, National Security Strategy, and the National Defense Strategy, NDS report. In the NSS report, China was identified as a revisionist power, seeking to, and I quote, displace the US in the Indo-Pacific region, expand its reaches of its state-driven economic model, and reorder the region in its favor, unquote. The NDS in 2018, the defense survey, uh, the defense strategy, clearly views China as a strategic competitor. Now, let us take a moment to look at the picture of the relative power positions of the two great powers and how they stack up. This is a snapshot, really, of the great powers. Blue is the United States, China is red, and you can see if you add up all the other 14 countries and compare it to the United States, the United States is almost, you know, the defense spending is almost as much as the other 14. The, uh, and um, in fact, five years ago, the US pipped the 15, the other 14, the next um, highest spending 14. Now, we come to the key defense stat statistics. And as I said, I am giving a snapshot of the relative strengths. Red is China, blue is America, India is green, Russia is brown, the United Kingdom is light blue, France is purple. And now looking at the, can we move the slides please? Looking at these slides, what you get is really a sense of the military assets, but it's not just bean counting. Huh? It, you have to look at the, the uh, generation of the weapons and the kind of military assets and the sophistication of the military assets. Uh, military analysts will go into detail to tell you, but it seems clear to me from this uh, snapshot, China is large, is stronger as a land power for now. The United States has strength in naval power and in air power, which the in naval power, I think China is building up. Now, next please. Please move. Looking at the tables, it is clear the United States is far ahead of China in military terms, but China now has a larger share of the world's economy. Can we move the slides, please? Thank you. But China now has a larger share of the world's economy. Using PPP exchange rates, the IMF has given China the top spot in the world's economies and ranks the United States as number two and India as number three. But according to the World Bank, US GDP, when you take it and not at PPP, is $20.5 trillion, whilst China's is $13.6 trillion. Now, it is said the United States still leads in soft power, though there has been an erosion in recent years because the, China, the US itself has changed. Can we have the next slide? This shows, figure four shows the Lowy Institute Asia Power Index. And the United States is seen as the number one power. Total score is 84.5, China is 75.9. And uh, the Lowy Index uses economic, military, diplomatic, cultural resilience, and a whole bunch of other things. Interestingly, Singapore measures eight. Look at the screen. And, uh, and this surprised people because um, bigger countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Pakistan did not uh, you know, rank as high as us. Now, David Schombau, a well-known uh, China expert, American China expert, says China is no match for the United States, but it is perceived to be militarily but and perception matters. 
it is not just the amount of money spent, but the lead that has been accumulated for years and how equipment, men, training, culture, leadership come together. There is also the fact that the US armed forces have been war tested over the years and more recently in Afghanistan and Iraq, whilst the Chinese military has not been in a war since 1979 against Vietnam. What is important is that many Americans believe China is catching up fast. Speaking at an Aspen Security Forum in July 2019, Admiral, Admiral Philip Davidson, the commander of the Indo-Pacific Command, said, and I quote, and he's, it's important what he says because of who he is, while China's capabilities don't outnumber America's in the region for now, it's possible they could overtake the United States in the next five years, unquote. There's a mood of minor hysteria in Washington these days. While the Republicans and Democrats do not agree on much, they share an anti-China hostility. They believe China's rise has come at America's expense, and the US needs to take a much tougher position with China. It is unfortunate for the relationship that the presidential election in November increasingly will make who is tougher on China an issue on the ballot box. President Trump, would want to use China to shift the scrutiny away from his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic and, and, and anti-racism. Now, the Chinese themselves do not believe they are on the same level of power as the US. In fact, in 2019, when China hoisted in the tense mood and the increasing talk of containment, the U.S. pushed back on Chinese activity, believing that China wants to push them out of the region. The U.S. Defense Minister General Wei Fenghe surprisingly said at the Shangri-La Dialogue before a gathering of the world's defense ministers. He said, China does not have the intention nor the capacity, Wu Yi, Ye Wu Li, to vie for the number one position with the US in the world. China could be adjusting its rhetoric as it realizes the United States is responding fiercely to smash the competition. I believe people think China is powerful, perhaps more powerful than it actually is at this moment, because a great power is inherently endowed with soft power. Because of weight and size, China has soft power by being, and that amplifies all other aspects of power. US too, soft power by being. Thus, strategic competition for dominance is the most salient reason unraveling the relationship. There is another. The US had hoped the integration of China into the international economic system would lead to a gradual opening up of the Chinese political system, resulting in a more open economy and society. That did not happen. Instead, they watched the new emphasis on party and ideology and the strengthening, strengthening of party committees in public and private firms. This triggered disillusionment and some serious re-evaluation, especially in the foreign MNCs the divergences in value systems as well as the operating systems have been noted by American leaders and commentators. Now, in fact, quite early on, Minister Mentor Lee Kuan Yew cautioned Graham Allison and Bob Blackwell when they interviewed him for their book. He, Lee Kuan Yew said, unlike other emergent countries, China wants to be China and accepted as such, not as an honorary member of the West. The Chinese will want to share the century as co-equals with the United States. Now, when strategic competition and differences in value systems combine, the rift, in strategic, the rift is strategic and ideological, which has led to talk of a coming second Cold War. 
The Trump administration is convinced that China wants to offer an alternative model and shape a world antithetical to the values and interests of the United States. China, on the other hand, believes the United States cannot accept China as a communist country and deep down wants to change China's political system. There is no strategic trust between the two powers and China believes the US is seeking in different ways to contain China's rise. Now, let me talk of the conflict I see in trade, investment, and technology. The bilateral, <clears throat> the bilateral relationship has been under constant train, strain over trade deficits and disputes, non-proliferation, Iran, North Korea, and human rights, but was managed within bounds. Market access was always a sore point for American companies and increasingly IP protection. Trump had long spoken out against trade deficits. In 1988, he was going after Japan. During the 2016 election campaign, he called China a currency manipulator, charged that China was raping the US and said he would cut a better deal to help American businesses and workers compete. In 2018, President Trump pushed the trade dispute into a trade war, which soon expanded into an investment war and a technology war. We are familiar with the difficult route to the eventual phase one trade deal. Settling that was hard and the global economy was highly sensitive to the outcome. Throughout 2018 and 2019, trade, investment and technology issues were caught up in the dynamics of the larger US-China strategic competition. And progressively, the issues moved to include ideology and values. Now, in the 20th century, national power, national strength, and global dominance will be decided by technology. It is in the area, it is in the area of the technologies of the future that the US-China strategic competition will be hardest fought and where red lines will be drawn. Technologies based on data and AI will determine productivity, competitiveness, and have an impact on national security. In fact, the two countries have been moving towards this realization for some time. During the Obama administration, there was increased awareness that Chinese venture capital firms, sometimes with support from state-backed sources, were structuring deals to bypass Cepheus to invest in, uh, to invest in and buy Sil Silicon Valley technology. In announcing Made in China 2025, China immediately put American business and government on alert and created alarm in security circles. This is a 10-year blueprint for Chinese technology self-sufficiency domestically and technology dominance internationally in, a long run, in the long run, funded by the state. There are other roadmaps, such as the document China's Next Generation Artificial Intelligence Development 2017, aimed at making China the world's number one in AI innovation by 2030. Now, as Hank Paulson, the former US Secretary of Treasury and an old friend of China put it, for Americans, made in China 2025 signals that foreign firms are not needed in many areas, but in the meantime, they are expected to act in ways that bolster China's indigenization of technology, knowledge, and business processes. It is not just that foreign technologies are being transferred and digested. It is that they are being reworked so that foreign technologies become Chinese technology through the indigenization process that many of the multinational CEOs I talked to, that's Paulson, to be, that they believe is grossly unfair to the innovators and dreamers at the heart of their companies, and that all is Hank Paulson. Paulson warned that this technology competition 
will spill into a technology war and an economic iron curtain would build new walls on both sides and unmake the global economy. And that would lead to decoupling. We see now segments of the administration and Congress pushing for the technology containment of China. In 2019 and 2018 and 2019, the Trump administration introduced measures seeking to contain China's technology rise. First, there was the passage of FIRMA, the US Foreign Investment Risk Reduction Modernization Act, which governs the reviews under CFIUS. And then there was the Export Control Reform Act, ACRA. FIRMA and ACRA, together these two pieces of legislation, expanded the range of deals the US government could review and block, and the range of technologies which would trigger a mandatory review. Secondly, there's a systematic review of the supply chains of the Defense Department, seeking to weed out the overdependence on China-based ICT supply chains to ensure supply chain security. Thirdly, the administration targeted Huawei as the Chinese icon which epitomizes the technology war. It has made it harder for Huawei to do business in the US, placing the company and its 68 of its affiliates on a list that US companies cannot sell to without government approval. And China has retaliated with its own list, but the administration has since then expanded the list a couple of times, adding more companies. And these uh, companies are entities that US agencies are prohibited from using and US firms cannot deal with them. High vision is the next big target and Chinese companies also with military ties. In May 2020, US Senate passed legislation to force US companies listed on the US stock exchange to delist unless they complied with US laws. This is denying Chinese companies access to US capital markets. The administration has gone further and has gone to its allies and partners around the world to put pressure on them to exclude Huawei in their 5G rollout. And third countries are under pressure to choose sides. Countries are bracing for the decoupling and emergence of two technology orders, each using different standards and norms. But there is a pushback. Reports throughout 2019 and the first quarter of 2020 suggests that US business is pushing back as the administration attempts to cut off China from access to American products. Companies that specialize in microchips, AI, biotechnology, and other industries are alarmed by attempts to restrict the flow of technology to China. This and the restrictions on Chinese investment in the US are seen as stunting the sector's growth in the US. The tech industry is warning that limiting access to the Chinese market would cripple American companies and end up undercutting the US as the biggest global hub of R&D as revenues from the mar that market fuel research innovation. And to give you an idea, China accounts for 36% of the revenue of US semiconductor producers. A New York Times report in 2020, February, suggests that foreign companies are moving away from American components and technology due to concerns that access to parts could be abruptly cut off because of policy turns. Ironically, decoupling is taking place in a different way. American companies are being driven to invest in research centers in Canada, Israel, and the UK to be out of reach of the American government. US companies share the administration's view that technology is a national security concern and needs protection, but they believe the regulations are too sweeping and broad. IBM has written to the Commerce Department asking for a redraft of the policy, which they argue will lead to the disengagement of US business 
from global markets and suppliers. They are uncomfortable with the policy of including economic threats, that is threat of competition as a national security threat. Still, on May 15, the Trump administration moved to block global chip supplies to Huawei. It expanded US authority to require license for licenses for sales to Huawei of semiconductors made with US technology. Consequently, expanding its, halt, its reach to halt exports to the Chinese company. So if you're a foreign company, like a Taiwanese company using US technology to make semiconductors, you can't sell that to the United States, TSMC in Taiwan. It is difficult not to conclude the tech war is in full swing. On the Chinese side, their companies are moving to limit or exclude American com components in their supply chain. One can expect the Chinese to accelerate their plans to achieve self-sufficiency given the US threats and measures. So they too are making decoupling happen. Tech an analysts suggest, however, that for now, there is a quiet continuity going on. China remains a very attractive productive production base for companies because of its trained labor, good infrastructure, and dense ecosystem of supplier networks. Southeast Asia apparently cannot replicate this. Electronic exports from China have risen steadily because of dense networks. And China is courting companies to stay. In fact, the US uh, FDI, foreign direct investment from 2010 to 2019, held steady in spite of Trump rhetoric. In 2019, Telsa put a $5 billion investment for its gigafactory in China. ExxonMobil committed to a 10 billion complex in Guangdong in 2018. So total economic decoupling is not really happening. But semiconductor decoupling might happen because of US restrictions and I think further technology. We should watch what happens next. Now, I have tried to give you an idea of how the rivalry and competition has expanded from trade and national security to investment technology and values. I would like to highlight briefly two other areas to show how the issues can broaden. Not only is technology dominance an issue, the type of technology development by China has also come under criticism. Mike Pence warned that China was using the BRI to spread Chinese technologies, standards, and values at the expense of the United States and Western values. The US says it is uncomfortable with Chinese AI technology for surveillance, that is face recognition, branding this as techno-authoritarianism. But a Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Study, and this is a US think tank, found that AI surveillance technology is spreading much faster to a wider range of countries than commonly understood. 75 out of 176 countries globally are actively using AI technologies for surveillance. 64 use face recognition systems. 36 of them are BRI countries. And 52 do smart policing. And it is not just China exporting AI surveillance technology. Many companies in liberal democracies, like the United States, Japan, France, UK, Germany, Israel, South Korea, also sell sophisticated surveillance technology to quote unquote, unsavory regimes, according to Carnegie. Now, the second area of expansion. This COVID-19 outbreak has become another platform for US-China rivalry. Since the outbreak late in January, American and Western media have been far more interested in using 
the virus epidemic in Wuhan to investigate and criticize China for the failures of an authoritarian system, the lack of transparency, the suppression of information, and the weirdness of Chinese eating habits, rather than what is being done to tackle a major public health problem. Allegations of the virus coming from the Wuhan lab were made without verification. The handling of the pandemic became an opportunity to score ideological points about democracy versus authoritarianism and against China. Now, it is true, China was initially slow in providing information and whistleblowers were muscled, but the reports were one-sided. As COVID-19 spread around the world and countries struggled to contain the virus, it is now grudgingly acknowledged that the Chinese actually handled that situation very well. China on its part has hit back. China is offering COVID-19 assistance to other countries to improve its image, a coronavirus diplomacy, and to gain soft power once its own situation is under control. There have been counter allegations by China that the virus may have originated from the United States. But China should do this carefully. They, there have been criticisms and there's a backlash on wolf warrior diplomacy. I mentioned this period because if you consider the reports in 2008 on SARS, US-China competition had not reached its high point then the media reports were serious and more objective, and internationally, the global community pulled together faster. Now, let me go to the next area of discussion, which is, is this going to be an inevitable war or avoidable war? Nowhere is the strategic competition played out more keenly than in the ASEAN region. ASEAN is, in a sense, a swing constituency. The US has been the hegemonic power for the last seven decades in Asia, providing a strong security and economic presence. The rise of China has been welcomed in Southeast Asia as both an opportunity and a challenge. Although there are two US treaty allies in ASEAN, Thailand and Philippines, they are less enduring allies for the US unlike Japan or South Korea, as they are not driven by the same existential need for the treaties. In recent years, the Philippines under President Duterte has rebalanced its policy, pivoting to China, but it continues to maintain US military ties, though it is ambivalent about whether to end the status of forces agreement so far with the United States. Thailand in recent years has gradually moved into the Chinese orbit. Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei are non-communist, non-airline states. Whilst Vietnam is a communist regime and Laos and Cambodia, once socialist states are close to China. So we are a mix. So Southeast Asia is an area open for Sino-American competition in the influence game and for the support of the ASEAN countries. And ASEAN is trying to do this by hanging together and creating a united ASEAN. Some analysts have taken to saying that Southeast Asia has now become the site for the new great game with uncomfortable implications for ASEAN. The South China Sea is where the United States will directly confront China. Although the parties in the South China Sea territorial district are China, Taiwan, and the four ASEAN claimant states, Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, and Vietnam. The US is very much a player in the region and regarded by the countries as the only effective counterweight to China. As the global superpower and the region's dominant power, the US Seventh Fleet has defended the freedom of navigation and overflight in the South China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, as well as the East China Sea. China's nine dash line claims 
and its increased activism in reclamations and military buildup in the South China Sea has not only alienated ASEAN claimants and increased anxiety in the region, it has sharply escalated the potential for conflict between the United States and China. The United States Navy has responded with regular and robust freedom of navigation operations called FONOPS, they sail ships through the waters, in the region's waters. This has brought the two navies in frequent confrontation. And the one that people remember most is October 2018 when the USS Decatur, an American destroyer, was in near coalition with a Chinese ship warship in the Spratly Islands. And there have been other four knots where the two sides are playing chicken. The US and China are both party to an agreement reached in 2014 to reduce a chance of incident at sea called the Code of Unplanned Encounters at Sea to prevent escalation. Both sides expect encounters in the South China Sea to be the norm. You know, should it happen where the ships collide, when a conflict happens, should that happen? One hopes what happened over the EP3 incident in 2001, when a US surveillance plane off the coast of China was shot at by a Chinese plane trying to chase it away. We hope that would be replayed. What happened? The plane landed in Hainan Island. Delicate diplomacy and ensured during, sorry, ensued during the George W. Bush administration when the new conservative hawks were in charge. Fortunately, wise counsel from George Herbert Walker Bush, Brent Scrocroft, and Colin Powell prevailed. The United States and China stared each other in the face and decided. It was not worth war. In the present period, President Trump is in charge. He does not want another war, which would hurt his election prospects and the US economy. And in his 2016 election campaign, he promised to end wars, but he has hawkish advisors. China is of course much stronger today than it was in 2001. But it is likely President Xi, given the many internal problems of China with a, a weakening economy and a recovery from COVID-19, may also wish to avoid war. Now, can war between China and the US break out over Taiwan? For China, Taiwan is an enduring core interest. It, was always regarded, it has always regarded the reunification of Taiwan with the mainland as something of an inevitability. Taiwan, however, has long links with the US establishment in Congress and in the State Department and Pentagon. There is also a mutual defense treaty which obligates the US to help Taiwan in case of an attack from China. US defense allies in Asia, such as Australia and Japan, are bound by their defense agreements to fight alongside the US to support Taiwan in such an attack. Now, in 2003, President George W. Bush sent a clear message to then Taiwan President Chen Shui-bian, who was pushing provocative tactics on the cross-strait issue. And he did this during the visit of Premier Wen Jiabao, Wen Jiabao to the United States. He said, we oppose any unilateral decision by either China or Taiwan to change the status quo. And the comments and actions made by the leader of Taiwan indicate he may be willing to make decisions unilaterally that change the status quo, which we oppose, unquote. Now, Bush drawing this line helped to stabilize cross-strait relations for a number of years. President Trump's White House has a different attitude on Taiwan, which borders on ideological. 
and could lead to standoffs with China, resulting in rash responses on both sides. In January 2020, after the Taiwan elections, a US warship sailed through the Taiwan Strait. This was presumably a response to China sailing its latest aircraft carrier, the Shandong, twice through the strait before the election. The Trump administration is openly helping Taiwan expand its diplomatic space, passing the Taipei Act, which strengthens the scope of US-Taipei ties and promises to help Taiwan gain access. Chai Ing-wen, at her second inauguration, did not refer to the 1992 consensus in her speech, and she maintained the, her past administration's opposition to China using one country, two systems to resolve the dispute with Taiwan. She said, cross straits relations have reached a historical turning point. Both sides have a duty to find a way to coexist over the long term and prevent the intensification of antagonism and differences. China is deeply suspicious that Chai would be moving towards the de jure independence. In the NPC uh, meeting on May 23, 2020, Premier Li Keqiang in his work report, report was noted to have dropped the word peaceful from reunif reunification, which is the standard reference to Taiwan. Now, this excited speculation that China would proceed to toughen on Taiwan. And in the May, but a week later, in a May 29 press conference, in reply to a question from China Times, a Taiwan newspaper, Premier Li, while reiterating the position that China remains committed to a one China principle, said, they firmly oppose Taiwan independence, but slipped in this line. We will continue to show maximum sincerity and do our very utmost to promote peaceful unif reunification of China. So the word peaceful came back, but I would not read it as China changing its stance from the work report, but that China is signaling nothing is off the table. So the Taiwan issue bears watching. Of course, there's now Hong Kong, and the, you all are reading about this every day. The US government took the side of the protesters with Congress passing the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act of 2019. And in 2020, with China's introduction of the national security law to cover Hong Kong, the Trump administration will withdraw Hong Kong's special status, which it currently enjoys with the United States. Now, whether it is the South China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, or Hong Kong, neither the US nor China, I think, want a conflict that is war with each other for many reasons, but they will push their positions to the furthest limits. For China, Taiwan and Hong Kong are core interests, and they have more recently defined South China Sea as core interests too. For the United States, it is about credibility as the guarantor of security and living up to the role of a predominant regional power. The main concern of the region is a conflict or war started by accident between the two powers. Before I finish, I am sure you would want to know, so is this a second Cold War? Henry Kissinger in November 2019 said, we are at the foothills of a Cold War. He is a man who have, has lived through the Cold War. Kevin Rudd, the former Australian Prime Minister, wrote in Foreign Affairs recently that this is Cold War 1.5. I would say the tech war is on, and you see student visas withdrawn, scientist visas withdrawn, particularly for specific areas uh, to do with AI, computer science, biotech. So we are one foot in. 
It is a tech cold war. Is it a cold war? I think a cold war has a certain structure. It has a military structure and an economic structure. Economically, the United States and its allies all want to participate in China's growth market. So the United States cannot shut China out. Not, so it's not the same as a Cold War before, not the US-Soviet Union uh, model of Mark I Cold War. If Biden is elected, his team believes the US must work with China. They, had, they will be firm, but they would not want to see the relationship you know, at sharp confrontation. They will work together on climate change, pandemics, and other transnational issues. I mean, that's now. Let's see what happens with the debates when they go on. But economically, I think the United States and China will still have something to do with each other, and so will Europe. Militarily, during the Cold War, I was reminded that the militaries of the United States and the Soviet Union confronted each other everywhere. You are not seeing this at this point, so it's not a Cold War. Now, it is expected that middle-sized and smaller countries will find themselves pressured by both sides to make choices in this contestation. States like Singapore are trying to work with those who seek to help avoid wars, to build a bridge, to create space between the two great powers. And I will take up this very important dilemma in my third and final lecture, analyzing the delicate path Singapore and the region are taking. Thank you, Professor Chan. May I now invite Professor Joseph Liao to start the Q&A session. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Chan, for your lecture. Uh, first, let me uh, apologize uh, again uh, to everyone for the little uh, glitch. Um, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if uh, the US and China could work together to sort out uh, and introduce, roll out uh, 5G for us so that we won't have these kinds of problems. But in any case, um, I think what we've heard uh, is a characteristically eloquent and thought-provoking lecture uh, from Professor Chan Hing Chi. Um, and uh, she's given us much food for thought. I was particularly appreciative of the fact that she had set the Sino-US uh, relationship in its historical context, and we need to bear that in mind when we look at uh, what has been happening, what is happening now in that bilateral relationship. Um, there have been a series, a whole series of questions that have been sent in, um, and uh, of course we are constrained by time, so I will try to accommodate as many as possible and uh, probably uh, group them as well. But um, if there are any questions that don't get uh, answered or don't get conveyed, uh, please accept my apologies uh, in advance. Um, but let me fire off the, the first question. Um, uh, Prof Chan, you, in your time as ambassador in uh, Washington, D.C., um, you basically, uh, that period covered the, the Clinton, the Bush 43, and the Obama presidencies. And that also overlapped with the terms of uh, Jiang Zemin in uh, China, uh, Hu Jintao, and, and a little bit of Xi Jinping as well. So in other words, you must have accumulated a wealth of observations uh, following the dynamics so closely from uh, a prized ringside seat. I wonder if you can share some of your, your, your views and your observations about um, how that relationship has uh, developed up to this point uh, from that vantage? Um, well, let me, uh, I'm going to try to be brief to take in many questions, but it's hard to be brief on this. Sure. Uh, I hope IPS gives us extra time. Eh? You took time out because <laughs> the system crashed. Okay. Indeed. indeed. Now, uh, I would say that, you know, when I, I was there, I, I arrived in the U.S. in 19... 96. Jiang Jimin, now, am I on? Wow. 
Okay. Jiang Jiemin made his first visit in 1997, and it was like, you know, a hiatus of 12 years before a Chinese president came mm. to the United States. And uh, bear in mind that in 1997, China is not what China is today, you know. Jiang Jiemin came to the United States and he wanted a good visit. It was important for him to look, uh, you know, he could get on with the United States and that uh, he was a, a player on, you know, he was an important player that the United States would respect on the world stage. So, and this, if you remember, is after the, you know, this was a time when uh, Chen Shui-bian was yes. around and, the, you know, so the Taiwan Strait was an issue. The visit was considered very good. And I think it was Jiang Jimin came and charmed everybody because he was humorous. He had a sense of humor. And uh, I think the visit went well. And he found that the United States had not changed its position on Taiwan. That was his main concern, you know. And I, during the Bush period, as I pointed out, there was initially, you know, this uh, difficulty with uh, the United States, uh, China and United States over EP3 because you had hawks, neocons yes. in the, at the start. But the early, you know, almost uh, near war or near conflict because of EP3 made everybody sober up. And the US-China relationship was very good after that. Now, let me point out that at any time, the relationship between the United States and China is filled with competition, cooperation, and you know uh, differences in views. And the United States has learned to manage that quite well. And China is learning to deal with the U.S. In fact, you know, I got the sense that they rather liked uh, Republican administrations. But when you ask the Chinese, when I talk to Chinese diplomats, they work out a relationship with China. In the beginning, the U.S. will be bashing, then they settle to a certain way. You know, as one diplomat said, you know, if we are going to end in this position, why don't we start at the position we will end at rather than start from somewhere else? Because every president seems to start a term fighting with China at odds with China. Then they come around and settle into a relationship with China. So that's the background. Competition, cooperation, and you know, you begin being tough, then they learn to deal with China. But China, in 1997, China during Hu Jintao's visit, 2000 and, you know, the, uh, I think Jiang Jiumin stepped down in 2002. So from there, Hu Jintao. China was not yet the China that has grown to what it has, what it is today. China only entered WTO in 2001. So, you know, it's different. You know, when uh, Xi Jinping came to Washington, and this was in 2012, January or February, I, I left in July. I attended a lunch, you know, and uh, I walked in to a hall and many of the uh, and US official whispered to me, you see this hall? It was filled with people, filled, packed. He said, you know, it's a rising power, you know? So that was the sense. But um, I think the relationship has really deteriorated. Thank you, thank you for your answer. Um, we have we have a ton of questions on Singapore and what Singapore needs to do, but um, you have a you have a lecture based on that. So maybe we will set that that set of questions aside for now. There's another set of questions on the international order. So let me uh, 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 sort of uh, break the question down uh, into digestible parts um, or, or the questions. So basically, there's interest in whether or not. Um, China really does or doesn't want to leave. I think you alluded to that uh, when you uh, talked about uh, the Chinese defense minister's comments uh, in Singapore. So um, I suppose, do we take that at, at face value or is it uh, you know, covering up 
uh, intentions to play a more active role. So that's one question. The second is um, we had we had a questioner ask this rather intriguing question: Why don't we let China lead um, so that it actually will have a stake in stability? Mm -hmm. And a, a third facet to the international order questions is. Why did the U.S. and Western countries think that integrating China into the liberal international order, as they call it, um, would change China's politics? So a whole set of questions. Uh, whole question. And uh, actually, Joseph, if you could also tell me who the question came from, oh, that okay. would be... Okay. Yeah? Yeah, then yeah. I can place the question. And yeah. a lot of the viewers, we you know, Singapore is a small place. We probably all know each other. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. But thank you very much. Um, let me take, wow, you gave me three questions. Huh? Uh, why don't we let China be so it will have a stake in... Let China the, lead the international lead order. Lead, play an active role leading the oh, international lead. order? I think uh, this is where it is difficult, you know. You had another question earlier about whether China now is, uh, what the general said was, you yeah. know, not an honest view, but, you know, is it uh, trying to be something else but will show its hand yeah. later. Yeah. You will note that throughout my lecture, I would say for now. You know, the picture is for now because China is a country that is growing, changing, you know, and so, and positions change, you know, strengths change, they shift, US also, you know, um, so I, and all the other countries too. So, but for now, I think China feels it is not in a position to challenge the United States, you know. Now, uh, why don't we let China lead? I think we, first, there are two reasons. It's not that nobody is letting China lead. China also doesn't really want to have a share of, leadership means you are a stakeholder, you have to actually take on responsibilities. And that could be shoring things up, supporting. And I'm not sure they want that role. They didn't want to be a stakeholder when Bob uh, Zelik offered them the role of a uh, responsible stakeholder. Perhaps they didn't share in that worldview, that's one. But also, would they want to carry the burden of being the global, part global uh, gendarme or policeman, you know, to help deal with uh, disasters, with conflicts here and there? So, I would say, uh, you know, the question is, does China want to lead in that way? I'm sure China wants to lead when it's ready to offer it and in a manner it wants to, you know. Now, uh, I think it's also very difficult for a power which has been predominant for so many years and has been, you know, it's been a hegemon, so its values, its policies, become acceptable to the rest of the world to give way, you know, to give its position and let another country lead. And I've noticed that the United States gets even a bit, you know, uh, touchy when Europe tries to take the lead. So, and when Japan tries to take a lead and these are allies, you know. So it's very hard from a predominant position to just allow another power to come in to lead which is why the adjustment in this redistribution of power is greatest for the United States. But China, I think, just feels that um, at this moment, it doesn't want to take that kind of primary leadership role because, you know, um, you would have to, are you prepared to underwrite the security in different parts of the world and enter into conflicts and so on? Okay, and then there was a question from uh, Victor Mills, um, the, the one uh, essentially about uh, values. Um, so why do the US or uh, the US and Western countries think that 
the the international the liberal international order free trade uh, would change the political systems of China. Why did they even think that? You know, this is Western liberal thought that if countries, if people get wealthier, they they will be more open. And when societies and countries get wealthier, there's economic development, it will change. And they will all want a certain kind of political system, which is open, democratic, and so on. And this is the belief, you know. So I think this is what the United States and Europe thought that by bringing China into WTO, allowing it to expand, being part of the liberal order, China will change. But as Lee Kuan Yew said, you know, China is not going to be an honorary Western gentleman. I think we underestimate the change in order, in the values and, sorry, we underestimate that it's hard to change values. The United States in particular, is a country that is messianic. It wants to change other countries. Democracy is wonderful. You know, they believe in it and they will try to promote it. In a way, China is not messianic. It doesn't want to promote values that way. That's why as an alternative model, China is not going to go around the world selling the Chinese model. As Prime Minister said, you know, China is an old country. America is a young country. It thinks every country should be like them and they would like to sell its values. China is an old country and thinks no other country can be like them. You know, so yeah. they're not going to go around selling their values in that sense. Yeah. That is yeah. why I don't think I you know, I read the the 19th Party Congress speech as China asserting the position that theirs is the right system, is that the Chinese system has brought millions of people, you know, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and it is the right system. So don't try to change me. Don't try to change my system. And those of you who want to use a system, fine. You know. Yeah, we, we get the impression that on the US side, it's very in, entrenched in the political psyche of the, of the nation. Um, let's move on. There's a question from uh, Lai Leong Fok, uh, ISIS. And uh, it's an important one, yeah. Because um, we've talked about the the rivalry and the the risk. Now he asks, under what circumstances would you see both the U.S. and China wanting to do more to reduce their areas of contention and increase their areas of cooperation? Everything is possible in the United States. You get the right two sides. I think both see they do have some interests that are congruent. The question is whether when you have different presidents, you know, you, they may reach for different things. All the presidents before the, uh, president, uh, the present uh, president have worked with China in some ways. Now, China has to give some. It is giving some now. And uh, opening up its markets and so on, they should have done that much earlier, frankly. Yep. And uh, I think there could be some areas where they could work together. They, the, for instance, I've been reading the writings of potential policy uh, makers in the next administration, and they all emphasize areas that they can work with China on, largely climate change. Now you can add pandemics and there are transnational issues, drugs and so on, trafficking. So I think there would be uh, presidents that would work that way. You know, Joseph, one of the things that I feel having lived in America, you know, for so many years, America is a country that changes. That's its strength. It renews itself. If you don't like it, wait for the change. You know, the pendulum swings. If it goes to an extreme, it swings back the other side. And I was wondering, you know, watching what is happening, whether we are beginning to see a start of another change. You know, I've been toying with this idea because now you are seeing this anti-racism. You know, you are seeing the just the courts, in fact, you know, 
emphasize that LGBT is part of civil rights. And you can put that under the Civil Rights Act. So I think something is happening in the United States and this racism push that I'm asking myself, has neoconservatism run its course? Has right-wing conservatism run its course? I, when I say run its course, I don't mean it completely disappears, but different thinking comes in, you know, for in, because we saw that happen. Counterculture, anti-war, you know, yep. that, that period brought in the conservatives afterwards. And now, do we see a swing slowly? Yep. It won't happen next year, but you are moving towards that. Yep. So yep. I think in the thinking on China, I'm thinking that uh, something could happen, but the rivalry between the United States and China will be there because China, the United States does not want to be number two. It has always been number one in recent history. Yep. In its, you know, so it would find it very hard to adjust. So they will compete, but does the competition have to result in war? Yeah. And I think they could work on other areas. Yeah, as you mentioned at the beginning already, it's a very much a structural phenomenon at work. Uh, but Prof, you have, you've left the, the door ajar, so I have to ask you, will we see a pendulum swing in November? Uh, this year? <laughs> you know, we are still many months from the election. Yes. And, you know, as you know, in the United States, it's like a lifetime. In fact, they say nothing really happens till after summer, you mm. know, in September. Then you mm. start looking at what happens. Mm. So, um, I, you know, I would not count President Trump, Donald Trump out, you know. Uh, mm. Right now, it, the numbers don't look good for him, yeah. but anything can happen. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Um, we have a question from uh, Drew Lexman um, on the decoupling. So he asks, who do you think will be the ultimate winner if there is a full decoupling of US-China relations? It seems that the US has more to lose as China always has its large domestic market to fall back on uh, if the US is closed off to them. Uh, you, when you say full decoupling, is decoupling in economics or you know in economic security, every other sphere? Mm. I just don't see that happening. But if that happens, because of the size of China, you know, I think it, it could be, in fact, split regions, you know. Yeah. And I think you will, you may see the order. If that happens, you may have split regions. Let me just leave it at that. Yeah. Actually, um, your, your point about split regions nicely segues into another question um, by uh, Rog, Roger Lim. And he asks, how do US allies like Australia, the UK, and Japan, how do they figure in this, uh, this bilateral standoff uh, and tension? Um, and uh, particularly given the, the um, support, initial support for uh, the economic overtures on the part of China. Uh, you know, the irony, Roger, is that in many of, many of the U.S. allies in Asia have China as the number one trading partner. You know, their economy is very closely tied up with China. And this is Australia. China is their number one trading partner. Japan, South Korea, you know, even Taiwan, if you look at that, but it's not, uh, is, a, is a territory, you know. Uh, the, uh, now, how do they square Right now, I think most of them are choosing security to be with the United States, but on economics is with China. Still, they are wondering when China or US will say, you know, you cannot be, uh, you know, with a foot in each hand. You cannot have security with the United States 
and e economics with China. You have to come on the same side. And when that happens is how do people choose, you know. But uh, even as you mentioned these countries, how would Australia choose? How would Japan choose? I think these countries have different leaderships, different parties, the mood changes. They can encapsulate the mood. So, you know, right now, um, it's certain leaderships of certain countries take the, co the country one way. Yeah. But a change of party could take the country another way. And I would argue that all the countries in the region, all of America's allies in the region would like to keep the position as it is, that they can you know, carry on with China as a trading partner and the econom economies tied up with China, although they talk of now diversifying, but still very much reliant on China. And it's the growth story right now, the first to come out of the gate from COVID. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah, and they would like to carry on with that, and they hope that would be so. And I am even I'm also con uh, thinking that even with Europe, China is the market, it's the biggest market. You know, how do you leave out the biggest market? So economics will speak to many decisions. Yeah, uh, and this is where I think um, you, we see the difference between the so-called old Cold War and what we are facing today, that economic dimension. Um, right. A question on ASEAN from uh, Kimiko Ishihara. Will ASEAN be able to put together a united front to address rising Chinese influence in the Indo-Pacific region? What are some issues that ASEAN would have to overcome before being able to do that? Well, as you know, ASEAN is made up of 10 countries, each with a different strategic perspective and perhaps a foreign policy outlook. You know, they have varying outlooks and it has been frankly not so easy to get ASEAN unity is always a challenge, but we manage when it comes to a statement. Mm -hmm. So it is there. And what is the, there are structural reasons explaining this because ASEAN was created as a regional organization that does not seek the kind of integration that the European Union does, is a cooperation, is a project of cooperation. Now, they've become much more integrated in many areas, whether it's economics, you know, whether it's even some views about, you know, uh, how they're going to, they want all to be market economies now, so economic uh, ideas. So we are integrating in the economy and we're trying to work out security um, uh, uh, some integration in security, but we have no pretense of coming up with a common foreign policy. Mm. And we have our own defense policies. So because of that, I think uh, whilst we all know we should stick together so that we can deal with the larger powers, with the great powers, it is a difficult exercise. Yet, if we do not have ASEAN, you would have to recreate ASEAN. Yes. Um, we have a question from uh, Danny Kwa, none other than Danny Kwa. Um, it, it's quite lengthy, but uh, and it's partly linked to Singapore. But I think it's worth it's worth uh, uh, me reading it and you thinking about it. Now, if in Singapore we are asked to choose between the US and China. What should we look at in how the U.S. has treated China that should make us trust America? So the question of uh, trusting the U.S. And he gives some examples of how um, the, the U.S. has shifted the, goals, the goalposts uh, on China. Um, and yeah, maybe in the interest of time, I won't read all the examples. But the main point being that if the, if the U.S. has 
constantly shifted goalposts uh, for China over the last decade and a half. Um, for other states, uh, not just Singapore, um, can we trust America? When I, now, unless I have the examples, I do not know, hi, Danny. I don't know what Danny means by changing the goalposts, but I would say there are a couple of enduring principles of the United States that you can look at. First, yeah. democracy. Second, security. You know, and it is a principle of uh, maintaining this liberal world order that the United States has led over the last 70 years, you know, and it is an order which is anti-communist, that is uh, where the United States and the Western allies are leading the order. Now, are you part of that? Are you not part of that? You know, they believe in democracy, they believe in human rights. And so the goalposts change sometimes if they, as with any, I guess, um, any great power or even China will react in this way. What is the major issue you are confronting at that time? China will call it a principal contradiction. You know, if that is the issue, then you adjust some of your principles on democracy and human rights and you work with some of the countries that you otherwise would not, you know, or under your principles you should not work with. So, you know, security allows you to be a little elastic on who you choose as partners. But mm -hmm. in other cases, they will come out very strongly on human rights and um, democracy. And mm -hmm. we've always felt analysts and uh, countries that, you know, if you are strategically important to the United States because you're a country that has oil or you are located somewhere where there's great competition between China and the United States, you know, you will be given some leeway. But if you are a country that is stuck in a corner, small, known resources, then they'll be really rough on you, you know, when it comes to human rights, democracy, and so on. Thank so, you. Uh, you know, the US change goalposts, yes, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think they have these principles as uh, constants. Yeah. Anyway, uh, apologies to you, uh, Danny, if I butchered your question, but uh, it would have taken me 10 minutes if I read <laughs> your entire question out. Um, let's move on to, to the next one. Um, and this one is a bit technical. It's from Jessica Yeo. Now, with the China uh, Central and Eastern Europe Investment Cooperation Fund, and the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, having the potential to box the US out of future international deals, how do you think this might impact the confidence level in the US, the US dollar, and the future of global trade and investment opportunities? Now, this China EU investment fund, how big is it? Okay. And can you box the U.S. out of future deals? First, you know, U.S. can always join. You know, it decided not to join. You know, in politics, everything is possible. You know, at another stage, the U.S. may say, why not? You know, although I think it will not. But I don't think it will box the U.S. out of uh, future deals because I don't think it would be so all-encompassing that there's no room for another player. Yeah, and... Okay, um, so we move on to the, the next question, and this is from uh, um, Salman Bukhari. And uh, Salman asks, could it be that the US, and uh, in some cases, the rest of the world, seriously underestimated the rapid rise of China? How did China's WTO accession help China's rise to what it is today? I think, uh, yes, probably the United States seriously underestimated and maybe all of us underestimated China's rise. Napoleon did not. I think Napoleon said, don't, move, what is it? Don't wake the sleeping, don't wake up, don't yeah. wake up the sleeping uh, <laughs> dragon. Yeah, dragon, I think, was it? And, oh, giant, uh, but anyway. Yeah, you yeah. know, uh, 
And yeah. I think he was right. Um, I think it's numbers. It's the size and the weight of China. And also the injet. They are very smart people. There, you know, it's the ingenuity, the creativity, you know. So I, I think they just, um, you know, the Ch Chinese have done very well by WTO because all of us have done well, frankly. When the moment countries, as you know, Joseph, even in Asia, Southeast Asia, the moment you open up your economy and move into the international realm, you know, you join the international system open economies, the economy will take off. And that was what persuaded a lot of countries in the region to become, you know, uh, to open up export oriented, not import substitution, join the, you know, world. And we've been, for a long time, we were trying to persuade Myanmar to do the same. If you open up, you know, things will happen. And yeah. in China, they opened up, they joined WTO, did all the right things. And China is a huge market. It's not just what China is doing outside. China is a market. So I think it's very attractive for all the investors. So we yeah. should not have been surprised. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one final question. Uh, we've already uh, gone uh, 10 minutes over already. So, so I'll, I'll give the final question to Zainal, uh, Zainal Rashid. Um, there, is some, there are some arguments in China that the technological decoupling will change China's economies, the Chinese economy's focus to innovation-centered development and emphasize Chinese techno-nationalism. And so his question is, do you see these prospects? Do you see this happening? You know, China is trying self-sufficiency now because I think they are forced to do so, and they will do it very rapidly. Is that techno-nationalism? You know, every country is getting more nationalistic, and I think, uh, you know, United States is also showing some techno-nationalism about their technology. So, you know, if China succeeds in really achieving everything they want, uh, they would be very proud of it. They'll be very nationalistic about it. And how will they deal? Will they be generous? How will they share technology? I, and, you know, that would be interesting. And would, and I think there needs to be some discussion about how you regulate AI globally, you know, and how we use technology. And would all the countries, China, US, every other country come in to talk about common standards? Because it's very, I am really, I haven't figured out because I'm not a uh, techie. How, you know, you are seriously going to run a world on split standards in a very real way. At some stage, you know, we have to discuss together. And if being techno-nationalist means you are world on to yourself and you don't want to talk with others and discuss standards and norms, yeah. You know, how are you going to, if you're going to export it, if it's going to be exportable, then mm. there has to be some discussion. Yes. Well, I think um, I have to bring the, the Q&A session uh, to a close because we are really running short of time. Um, you know, I always look forward to listening to uh, Prof Chan's uh, lectures because you learn so much within uh, that short uh, period of time. And uh, again, uh, not disappointed. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. Um, really, um, it was a tour de force, uh, not only on Sino-US relations, but really on the, the broader canvas uh, on which this portrait of this bilateral relationship is, is being painted. Yeah. Um, and uh, you also, I think uh, the subtext to your lecture also makes a point that uh, just as China and the US are shaping the world, they are also being shaped by the world, by larger uh, developments, as is their bilateral relationship. Um, I think this segues nicely into the question of how we in Singapore uh, can, should, must, position ourselves uh, in relation to these dynamics, but that's not for tonight. That is for your next lecture, which I encourage everyone to take note of uh, the, the date. Uh, I believe it happens after the election, so uh, no excuse. <laughs> so um, until the next uh, lecture, I think 
it uh, now just uh, leaves me to thank you on behalf of our virtual audience, uh, Prof Chan, for a very uh, fantastic, uh, illuminating lecture. Thank you very much. And applause for you. And you. Um, we will now pass the floor, pass the mic back to the MC. Thank you, Prof Liao. Thank you, Prof Chan, for the very interesting Q&A session. We've come to the end of today's lecture. We would like to hear your view on the event. Please click on the link on our Facebook comment to submit your feedback. Prof Chan's third lecture will take place on 15 July. Details will be on our website and Facebook page. We hope to see you then. Thank you all for attending this evening's lecture. Good night. <laughs>